It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Robert Geislinger. The Legend of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table is a tale as old as time. Well, today I'm going to see if we can try to recreate the feeling of being one of those Knights of the Round Table and even questing for the Holy Grail in a Euro game. Today, I'm taking a look at Lancelot. So here we're taking a look at Lancelot. Now this is a game where players are knights of the round table trying to prove their valor and be elected as first knight. The game is played over eight rounds with the knight with the highest valor points at the end of the game being declared the winner. Now the first phase of the game is the movement phase. And in the movement phase, players will be moving their knight token through the map, taking actions as they stop. Now this is a worker placement game, but things are linear. So as a, wor as a knight moves, they have to follow this path but they can go as far down the path in a single move as they wish but each of these stops will have a unique set of rules and rewards unique to it when a player moves they're going to move to the spot they wish and then they're going to flip their token over to the opposite side indicating that they have taken their turn other players will follow in suit until all players have gone and have flipped over theirs at that point the person who is furthest along the track will take their turn moving forward and flipping their knight as such now real quick i'm going to take you through what each of the spots on the board does. The first sites are the Joust and Stronghold. Now these act fairly the same and when you enter them you must enter in on the first space of the chosen track that you wish to go on and then you proceed each turn one down. Now you are allowed at any point to jump out of the track and move forward but you only collect rewards as you move into the spaces. So going here would get me one of the Squire tokens. The next turn I would gain a Sword token. The next site is the Distant Lands. Now when you enter this, you can enter on any of the spaces, but you can't go back. So I could go here, then here, then here. But each one of these allows me to take a card, either a pink or a white here, a green or a white here, or a red or a white here. Next up, we have Merlin. Now Merlin, you have to come in on the first space, and in the next turn, you could advance to this. If you advance to the second one, you do take a Merlin token. Next up, we have the lake space. Now the lake space is special, and then only one player per round can even enter it and go questing for Excalibur. When they do so, they must come in on the rightmost space and then proceed until they collect this token at which point then they can move off having this token allows them at the end of the round to take the Excalibur sword into their possession another note about the lake is that the player currently in possession of Excalibur can do this themselves in order to defend holding on to it the next two stops are Percival and Galahad now Percival allows you to learn a knightly virtue however there's a catch you must have already started on the path of learning it by visiting Galahad, who is further along the path. So real quick, let me take you over to the Virtue Board so I can explain better how these work. The Virtue Board allows players to gain victory points for each Virtue, but only once per game. When they visit Galahad, they're going to place one of their discs here in one of these Virtues in the Galahad spot. However, then later when they visit Percival, it's going to allow them to pick one where they're at and slide it over, provided they meet the requirements printed on that particular Virtue. That's going to give them either the big or small victory point number depending on whether or not they've taken the Arthur advantage during a round table. So if they have a disc here, that means they're going to get the larger number. If they don't, then when they slide over, they're going to get these smaller victory points. Some of these are such as the dexterity, where the player needs to have the highest number of one type of weapon token at the table in order to complete it. Another one here, strength, that means they have to have exactly five of the red cards in their hand and exactly one squire token. And then we have honor here, where it means they have to have the most squire tokens at the table and they need to have exactly seven of these plot cards in their hand. The next step on the path is the dragon. The dragon allows you to go questing and complete deeds. The thing is here, only two players per round can complete them, so at the end of a round there will always be at least one left. In doing so, you're simply going to need to exchange out the tokens that are printed on it in order to gain the victory points and take this deed into your possession. However, 
The Excalibur symbol just means that you need to have Excalibur in your possession. You do not give it up in order to do so. So in this case, we would need and the, have the Excalibur and we need to have two mace tokens. If we had those in our possession, we would complete this deed gaining one victory point. After the dragon comes Morgana. In the Morgana space, you do have to have already taken the Mordred advantage, which I'll cover here in a little bit when I go over the round table, in order to have already placed your eye in one of these spaces. Going here allows you to flip over that eye, and that allows that player to go around the board a second time within the same game round. Now the final stop along here before the round table is the grail spot. And the grail spot is special in many ways. The first being when a player comes in here, they place into the rightmost spot. Then they get to advance their token either one or two spaces along the grail track. If they are not currently the lead player, they can move forward two spaces. If they are the lead player, then they will move forward one space. The thing is, is once you're in this spot, on your next turn, you can choose to remain here in order to do the grail action again, or you can choose to move to, off of it onto the round table. However, if at any point, at least one player is at the table and all other players are on the grail position, then all players must move from the grail spot to the table. When a player moves onto the round table, they select one of these spots to occupy. Now this will not only gain them their player order for the start of the next round, it will also gain them an advantage. Now this advantage will remain in effect until another player takes it in a later round. Advantages here can include placing a disc on the virtue board that allows them to collect the higher point values, and they do that via Arthur. They could possibly just take a Merlin token. They could place their Morgana Eye token. They could get a discount at the dragon, or even just simply gain a simple victory point. Players also, when they arrive at the table, have the option of spending Merlin tokens. This will allow them to discard or exchange cards in their hand as they cannot hold more than seven at a time, and this is the only way that you can discard them from your hand. This also allows you to get rid of any number of Squire tokens as well for the cost of one of these tokens. The game is played until the end of the eighth round where additional points will be awarded for majorities in the various token types. The player who has Excalibur in their possession will get three points and then the player who is furthest along on the grail track will get a number of points equal to half the distance between them and the person in last place with a minimum of two points awarded. Whoever has the most points is the winner and declared first night. Now that's a look at Lancelot. Now I did say at the top of the overview that this was a worker placement game and that's not really true. This is a worker movement and action game where you're moving that one worker, your knight, along the path and taking the associated actions. This game for me really does feel like a sum of its parts because on the surface when you first look at it and you break down the individual mechanisms the game doesn't seem very interesting. But over time you start to see how all of the different pieces work together. The game really does add these little extras that allow the players to divide and start to follow their own paths towards victory. One thing of special note there is the advantages, because each player starts out with one advantage of the round table, and that already sets them off in their own unique path. However, when you get back to the round table, you take another advantage. And if another player at the table doesn't take an advantage that you previously held, you continue to hold it. So you can hold on to multiple advantages potentially in future rounds. In addition, the virtue board doesn't seem very interesting outside of the clever use of sliding the token over at first glance, but when you see that players over time will start to pick different virtues, because you can't do them all, but you can only do each one once, that also starts to really divide the players into the goals that they're working towards achieving. The theme isn't particularly thick at first glance either. It's there, but really it seems like the game could have been about other things until you start to play and you get into the middle rounds and you do start to feel like you are going on these quests and searching for the grail and the lady of the lake for the sword, things like that. And so the theme does come alive, but it comes alive very slowly. The artwork on the board is really nice. I do enjoy it. I like how it's a little muted and a little understated and fits the theme. One thing I didn't show in the overview that I'm going to show you now is the back 
back of those ship cards do have artwork on them that correspond with the particular type that they are. You have the plots, the ladies, the enemies, and the knights. Another thing I didn't emphasize in the overview was the Morgana action, but it's actually really interesting because you need to pay attention to when you decide to even take it if you do, because it allows you to move around that track again and gather your strength and resources and maybe score those extra points, but it allows the other players at the table to take more advantage of working on the grail track now the grail track was probably my least favorite thing in the game it's not that i didn't like it it's just that i didn't find it particularly interesting to me however it does seem to simulate searching for the grail and that you feel like you're just inching along with players remaining in tension throughout by and far the thing that i enjoyed the most in this game was how each stop on the path feels like its own unique thing. You're doing something different and it has its own set of rules and restrictions, especially for say the Lady of the Lake where only one player can do it. And if I have Excalibur from the previous round, I could choose to go forward and do it again so that another player can't. And the Dragon, where only two players can embark on those quests to get those little extra points. And this game really is a race of little points here and there as you move along and hopefully you come out ahead. Head. As to player count, the game really does benefit from max players. I did enjoy the game at two players. I think it's a perfectly fine game for that count, but I really felt the theme and the gameplay itself came alive when I was playing with the full four player count. As I said at the top of the review, this game really is the sum of its parts. And the theme does come alive if you get into the spirit of it and you see how things evolve over the eight rounds of the game. I really did enjoy the elegant simplicity of this design, and I found myself wanting to play it again immediately after doing so. For that reason, this game is going to be a keeper for my collection. I definitely recommend it, and it's going to get a Dice Tower seal of approval from me. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Lancelot, and it's helped you decide if this game might be right for you and your game group, and if you'd like to embark on a quest to become the first knight. And I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.